The Bible describes the time just prior to Jesus coming in a particular way. We will be studying over the next number of weeks some of the different facets of the end time scenario. One of those areas that we covered recently was the fact that the Bible says in the last days there will be a one world government, a global empire just sort of dominating the earth. In addition to that, there will be a singular world leader, a man who is enthusiastic, he's energetic, he's charismatic, and he will bring the world hope for peace in the future. Another thing that we'll see is a coalition of nations and religions around the world coming together as one, sort of going back to the days of the Tower of Babel, where people will gather together to make a name for themselves, to create their own sort of pseudo-religion. Another thing that we'll see is that the earth will begin going through what Jesus calls birth pangs, where the signs of the times begin to show with massive famines and earthquakes, different plagues and diseases beginning to rise and emerge that we have nothing to do about. We'll see many different things like this. And this morning, we're going to talk about the Antichrist, that world ruler that will come on the scene in the last days. Now, Jesus said over in John chapter 5, verse 43, He said, I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. And when Jesus said that, he was referring to the Antichrist, whom the Jews and the rest of the world will hail as a hero. The world which has rejected Jesus Christ will embrace the Antichrist. Rejecting the Prince of Peace, they will opt for a ruler that promises peace. The Bible says in the last days that people will be saying peace and safety, peace, peace. But there is no peace. And the world is ready for the Antichrist. That won't be his name. It won't be anti-G Christ. We don't know his name, but the world is ready for a ruler. The world is ready to consolidate power and hope behind a single leader that will promise peace and security. If you don't believe it, let me read to you from the first president of the United Nations General Assembly. Paul Henry Spock was also the prime minister of Belgium. He said, we do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all the people and to lift us up out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, be he God or the devil we will receive him. Jesus said, I came in my father's name and you did not receive me. Another will come in his name and him you will receive. The stage is being set for a singular global leader. To the world, he'll be a great deliverer. But to us, knowing the scripture, he will be the devil. To the world, he'll be a savior. But to us, we'll know that he'll be Satan, come in the flesh practically. He'll be called by many different names in the Bible. He'll be called the man of sin. In the Bible, we read that he's called the son of perdition, as was Judas in John chapter 17. He's called the little horn in the book of Daniel. He's called the self-willed king. And in Revelation, he's called the beast. And we know him as the Antichrist, primarily because of a couple verses in the book of 1 John and 2 John. 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and 22 says this, and I will read it for you. John says, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Verse 22 says, Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Second John chapter 1, verses 7. For many deceivers have gone into the world who do not confess that Jesus came in the flesh. This is a deceiver and the Antichrist. And so there are many Antichrists. And John was referring to those who were saying that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, that he was not who he said he was. And so throughout the ages, there have been many different Antichrists, many people who have stood and sort of represented evil. They've represented the devil in the world. And it could be something as simple as rejecting who Jesus said he was. There are many Antichrists and there are many Antichristians. The devil has his own church. As a matter of fact, when Peter was thinking according to the flesh and he told Jesus, no, no, you're not going to go to the cross, what did Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. Because he was speaking with that voice or with that mentality of the world. Now get this straight, Satan is the ruler of this world. When we sign our insurance forms, it doesn't cover acts of God. 
Why do we blame God for all the natural disasters that happen? When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, we essentially gave over the authority that God gave us to rule the earth. And we gave it to the deceiver. And so Satan rules this world. Jesus, when he was tempted in the book of Luke, you can read it. Satan came to him and said, if you bow to me, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world. Why? Because he had power and authority. Jesus didn't argue with him. This world is run by the devil. If you don't believe it, just look around. The devil rules this place. I mean, there is sin, there's crime, there's evil, there's abuse, there's all kinds of addiction, and and weeds still grow in your garden. This world is in big trouble. Jesus Christ is coming, and he'll save it from all that. And yet there are many antichrists, but what about the antichrist? Is it Vladimir Putin, Prince Charles of Wales, Henry Kissinger, Adolf Hitler, Saddam Hussein, Joseph Stalin, Antiochus Epiphanes, Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush, Billy Graham? All of these names have been found using the cipher that people look for in Revelation chapter 13. They've used this number 666 to determine who they believe the Antichrist is. And as a matter of fact, anybody's name can can be fit into that cipher if you look through this lens of 666. But that's not what we're looking at. We're going to find out what 666 means. What does the Antichrist look like? He's tall, dark, and handsome. No, we don't know that. But we're going to find out what the Bible describes him as. How will people know him? Where does he come from? And when will he come? Well, we know that he will rise out of Europe, out of those former Roman states as a man of peace. He'll amass incredible political and military power. And in peace, he'll seem to solve the world's big problems, especially the tension in the Middle East and Israel and Jerusalem. From Israel, at the same time, the Antichrist is rising out of Europe. Another leader will rise out of Israel. He'll be known as the false prophet. He is another beast altogether. We'll read about him in Revelation chapter 13 this morning. But he is going to actually hail this political leader from Europe and cheerlead his cause to his own people, the nation, the Jews. And he will allow them and enforce a treaty between Israel and this global leader. It'll be a seven-year covenant, a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. And then in the middle of this peace treaty, the Antichrist will march into the temple, the Bible says, and he will demand to be worshipped as God himself. He will turn on the Jews. And he'll try to finish what Hitler started. Hitler, Herod, Haman, hell itself has been trying to deal with what they call the problem of the Jews, the annihilation of Israel. And... This man will seek to accomplish what he calls the final solution, to destroy all the Jews in the world. Now, from the beginning, it's been like this. You remember as we studied through the book of Genesis that from the very get-go, there would be hostility between Satan and the person who would bring the Messiah. Remember Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed and your seed. And when we discussed that, we talked about the fact that her seed spoke of the virgin birth, because, of course, women don't have seed. Men have seed. And so the promise of the coming Savior would come through a woman who wouldn't need the seed of a man. That's interesting. Of course, Jesus did fulfill that. He was born of a virgin. And throughout Scripture, he was hoped for and looked to. There was a longing in the nation of Israel. It was the desire of all women to bring forth the Messiah. Well, Jesus came. They rejected him. And so now... They're going to receive the seed of the devil, the seed of the serpent. And all the way up into Revelation chapter 12, from the beginning of the Bible to the very end, we have this tension between Satan and the bearer of the Messiah. And so Satan has wanted to destroy the Jews from the very get-go. Whether it be Herod, whether it be Haman, whether it be Pharaoh, whether it be Antiochus Epiphanes or Hitler or the pogroms, anti-Semitism has existed in the world from the beginning. That's because Satan hates Israel and he hates the Messiah who came from her. We have this picture in Revelation 12 of a dragon waiting until a woman gives birth to a child who will rule the nations. Of course, it's a picture of Jesus. The woman gives birth and the child is caught up to heaven. Of course, Jesus crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended to the father. And so Satan, that dragon, seeks to destroy and eat the woman. And so from the very beginning, hostility between Israel And Satan. And in the very end, there will be hostility between Israel and the Antichrist. And so what will this person be? The seed of the serpent? What does that mean? Will he be like the the demon child, Damien, 
of the omen? Is that what it's going to be? Sort of the son of the devil? We have the son of God and the son. I'm not sure. Maybe. Uh, is it going to be just a person possessed by Satan? Peter worked right alongside Judas, who was later possessed by the devil. You could see Satan trying to get in there, influencing their thoughts, getting into literally, the Bible says, Satan entered Judas, who would then betray Jesus. He might be, but we read more about it in Matthew chapter 24. We're going to go through these verses, and there's so much to talk about here, but we're going to focus primarily on the scriptures that refer to the Antichrist. Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 1, says this, Then Jesus went out, and he departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. They were magnificent buildings, and they said to him, Jesus uh, said to them, rather, as they pointed out these amazing buildings, Jesus said in verse 2, Do you not see these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. By the way, the Romans would later do that very thing. In 70 AD, when the temple was burned down by Titus, the general of the Roman army, the temple caught on fire and the gold melted into the cracks of the stones and every single stone was removed, just like Jesus said, to get to the nuggets of gold that had melted in between. But as Jesus said this to the disciples, they they thought, how could this possibly be? And so when he sat down on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and asked him three questions. They said, when will these things be? When is the temple going to be destroyed? He would answer that. And they asked him a second question. What will be the sign of your coming? And then a third question. And the end of the age. And so in this passage, Jesus will allude to the destruction of the temple, which will take place just 40 years after this. And then he'll allude to and speak about the end of the age as well as his coming. Notice what Jesus says first in verse 4. Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not troubled for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. We discussed some of that last week. You're free to pick up a copy of the CD if you want to learn about wars of rumors of war as well as nation against nation. Jesus says in verse 9, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. The tribulation that we receive from the world, that the Jews would receive from the Romans, hostility, hatred, it's one kind of tribulation, not the great tribulation that God will pour out on the earth in the last days. Jesus says in verse 10, then many will be offended and betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations. And then the end will come. Notice verse 15. It's an important verse. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. And then Matthew adds, whoever reads, let him understand. And we want to understand this, so we're going to look at Daniel's writing in a moment. Jesus says, when you see this, standing in the holy place, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who was on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in the winter when it's cold or on the Sabbath when everything's shut down. Then there will be a great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise up and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, don't go out. Or look, here he's in the inner rooms, don't believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, when lightning flashes in the sky, you know that was lightning, wasn't it? So don't believe anybody who says, oh, the Christ came. He's back in the back room or he's out in the wilderness. Let's go because they're a false teacher, 
a false prophet. And so many antichrists will come. But as Jesus gives this passage to the disciples, this over, overarching theme is you have to be on guard against deception in the last days. In the last days, there will be just uh, an influx of false teachers and false Christs, many antichrists, as John would say. Who would have thought the idea of a cosmic Christ consciousness where a certain ethereal mentality can be reached by every single human being on the planet called the Christ consciousness can be attained just by receiving it. Did you know that that's a prevalent theory and doctrine in Buddhism, in New Age movement today, that the Christ consciousness is not a singular Christ, but it's everybody. Everybody is Christ. You have Christ inside of you and you just have to realize it. It became vogue in the past 20 years. I think it was Shirley MacLaine back in the 80s who went out on a limb and she said, I am God, I am God, I am God. And this thing has steamrolled. It's like a snowball effect. The whole world is going after this mentality that you can be a Christ. There's a guy who just visited Florida. His name's Jose Miranda. He claims to be Christ in the flesh, Christ incarnate. He claims to be God. The funny thing is all his, his uh, followers have tattoos of 666 all over their bodies. They're we, they wear T-shirts. People come out in droves to hear this guy, Jose Miranda. But this stuff is all over the place nowadays. There's a guy for many years named Benjamin Krem. He hails the coming of Maitreya or the fifth Buddha. Uh, as sort of the new Messiah who is going to come. He claims to have many encounters with Jesus Christ. People are saying that the Christ didn't come just for the Christians or those who would believe in him, but he came in different forms to everybody. He came as Krishna to uh, those Hindus. He came as Buddha to the Buddhists. He came as Muhammad to the Muslims. And so the Dalai Lama, as a matter of fact, actually claims to be God in the flesh, incarnate. And so all of the world today, you have this incredible emergence of false Christs, false teachers. But these aren't the Antichrist, the singular one. Jesus said here in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, that when you see the abomination of desolation, what is that about? Well, let's turn over to the book of Daniel. Daniel was written in the 6th century BC. And in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, we have what's known as the prophecy of the 70 weeks. We have to do a very brief summary because we want to focus on the end, that of the Antichrist. Daniel 9 verse 24 says this, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. What does that mean? 70 weeks. That doesn't sound like a long time. Just about three months, two and a half months, doesn't it? No, that's not what it means. The word week is the Greek or the Hebrew word shavua, and it just means seven. We have a word dozen, that means 12, or decade, that means 10. And so when God gives this to Daniel, he means 70 groups of seven. That's 490. And so 70 weeks or 70 sevens, some versions read, are determined for your people, the Jews, and for Jerusalem. Notice he says, verse 25, no one understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, total of 69 weeks. And so the prophecy is given that your people have 70 weeks left to finish up everything to finish all vision and prophecy. And so get this, Daniel, there will be 69 weeks from the time a decree is issued until Messiah comes into Jerusalem. 69 weeks. That's 483 years. If you want to break it down more particularly, you could break it down into days. A Babylonian calendar has 360 days. 483 years is 173,880 days. I figured that out before. I'm not very good at math, but 173,880 days from the time a decree is issued to rebuild Jerusalem. Well, what happened in history? Artaxerxes, the king, issued a decree in 445 BC. It was March 14th, 445 BC. Our time clock begins ticking. You go 483 years or 173,880 days, 
from 445 BC, it gets you to the year 32 AD, April 6th. That was the day that Jesus came riding into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, and they hailed him as Messiah. It was the very day, to the very day, of course, Jesus rode and he looked at Jerusalem and he wept and he said, oh, if you would have known the things that were for your peace, but you did not recognize this, your day. Psalm 118, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now we sing that about every day, but that psalm was written for that one day. It's the song of ascents, they call it, where, where you ascend ascent up into Jerusalem. Well, that was the song they sang while Jesus came in. This is the day the Lord has made. And then Psalm 118 goes on and says, the stone which the builders rejected, Jesus would be rejected, has become the chief cornerstone. And so the Jews did reject. 69 weeks were fulfilled. Well, actually, that's what the Bible says here. Notice it says in verse 26, after 62 weeks plus the seven 69 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. So Daniel prophesied it exactly as it happened. Jesus was cut off. The word cut off is karat. In Hebrew, it means to be cut as an offering, a sacrifice. And so Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. It was for you. It was for you and I that he was sacrificed. And so the Bible explains it clearly here. He will be cut off, but not for himself. And notice this verse, verse 26. And the people of the prince who is to come, that's the Antichrist, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The people of the prince who is to come. Who destroyed the sanctuary? Who destroyed the temple? The Romans. And so later on in history, the prince of those people, the prince of the Roman Empire, will come. And then it says there, the sanctuary will be destroyed with a flood or a dispersion as the Jews were dispersed throughout the world at 70 AD until the end of the war, desolations are determined. For our purposes, look at verse 27. Then he, this is our last week, there's one seven-year period left for the Jewish people. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. He is the prince of those people, those Roman people. The prince who is to come shall confirm a covenant with the many for one week. Confirm means to enforce. The many speaks of the majority. You don't have to have everybody in a consensus. You just need a majority in politics. And so he will confirm with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. This means that the Antichrist who rises up will be hailed by the Jews, as Jesus said, him you will receive. He will cut a covenant with them ostensibly to rebuild the temple because the other one was destroyed. By the way, I've showed my father-in-law who is Jewish this scripture and it's just amazing the contortions you can go through to bypass the fact that it says Messiah will be cut off. Um, If you have a Jewish friend, ask him what that means. Messiah will die. That's what it says. And it says then the sanctuary will be destroyed. And so between the time Daniel wrote this and the temple was destroyed, Messiah must have come before then. Messiah must come before the destruction of the temple. Of course, he was. And so it says, after that, though, we skip 2,000 years into the future. That prince from the Roman people, the revived Roman Empire, he will confirm a covenant with the Jews for one week, one seven-year period. And then in the middle of that week, in the middle of that seven-and-a-half-year period, three-and-a-half years in, that's 42 months, 1,260 days into that contract that he makes with Israel and with Jerusalem, probably to rebuild the temple, to give peace. He will march into the temple. We know from another scripture, he'll sit down and say, worship me, I am God. And so it says he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. That's the abomination of desolation. Even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. An abomination in the Bible speaks of idolatry, worshiping a false god, a graven image. And one at this level or at this extent is one that is so drastic in the world that it will cause the earth to be desolate. At this point, God will pour out his wrath on the world, the abomination of desolation, and that will last for 42 months, three and a half years. Now, turn over in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
The temple was rebuilt by the people of Israel after Artaxerxes gave that command. It wasn't a grand temple, but it was a temple nonetheless, and they began sacrifices. And a man did come and he put a halt to those sacrifices in 165 BC. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes. He was a Styrian. He was a wicked man. He killed the priests. He tortured anybody who wouldn't offer incense to Zeus. He truly was a type of the Antichrist. And he actually went into the temple and he offered a pig, an unclean animal, on the altar there in Jerusalem. And the people were devastated. And in that period, you read in history about the period of the Maccabees. Now, the Maccabees were a family of Jews under a priest by the name of Matthias. He had five sons. One of those sons was named Yehuda or Judah Maccabee. And he caused a revolt and they fought against the Syrians and they won some just amazing battles. The Syrians used elephants in their wars, huge hordes of people and Judah Maccabee. Maccabee means uh, good shot. They were great shots, excellent shots, uh, marksmen with their slings and their spears and their bows. And so they did do some amazing things. And yet Antiochus Epiphanes wasn't the full fulfillment of the Antichrist because later Jesus would say, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, then flee to the mountains. And so Antiochus Epiphanes was one kind of Antichrist, but not the fulfillment of it. In 40 AD, the emperor Caligula was a sick, crazy man. He actually ordered that his image would be erected in the temple. Sounds a lot like what the Antichrist will do. His soldiers refused because they knew it would cause a riot, and he shortly died after that. Some say Nero was the Antichrist, but nothing like what the Bible describes Nero did. Notice in verse 3 of Second Thessalonians 2, Paul the Apostle says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And notice this, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Judas was also called the son of perdition over, I believe, in the book of John. And so that man, he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so it seems that in the last days, the temple will be rebuilt. You know, in Jerusalem, there's a group of people called the temple faithful. And every year they drive around the Temple Mount, which is sort of occupied by Muslims and the Palestinians. They have one of their second most holy sites there, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, as well as the shrine, that golden dome. And so they kind of control that. Now, the Jews for years have wanted to get up on the Temple Mount, but they can't get up there. They've actually made plans, this group called the Temple Faithful. One of their plans a number of years ago was to have somebody parachute in with a makeshift altar and quickly sacrifice a lamb. They're desperate to get up there and rebuild the temple. And so every year, a truck drives around the temple mount with a giant stone in the back because they want to get up there and lay that stone and rebuild their temple. But they can't do it because it'll cause too much strife, too much tension, and they can't get up there. And so the Bible says here, though, that the Antichrist will actually stride into the temple and he'll claim to be God and demand to be worshipped as God. And so we read over in Revelation chapter 11, verse 2, that John was told to rise and measure the temple. But then he's told, leave out the court. Don't measure it because it has been given to the nations or the Gentiles to tread for 42 months, three and a half years. In the year 2000, Bill Clinton, president of the United States, offered a plan that the United Nations would take control of the Temple Mount. Right now, the UN classifies Jerusalem as a World Heritage Site. It has special interest to them. And Clinton's plan, which was rejected, because what it it said was, let's give over the authority of the Temple Mount, the hotbed of all the strife and conflict in the world today, the holiest city, practically, for Jews and for Christians, and the second holiest, aside from Mecca, for the Muslims. Let's give that over into the hands of the United Nations, They will set a police force there and they will manage peace. And that plan was rejected, but they're still considering doing this very thing. This would be a fulfillment of Revelation chapter 11, that the nations would trot it underfoot. They would be there in force, in a presence. And so we read here in 2 Thessalonians that the temple will be rebuilt. Verse 5, as we continue on, 
Paul reminds the Thessalonians, do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. Here Paul speaks about the Antichrist being restrained. He cannot be revealed. It says in verse 7, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Speaks of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit in the church, in the world today, when the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way in the rapture, then the Antichrist will be revealed. Verse 8 says, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of this lawless one, in verse 9 says, is according to the working of Satan. And so his power comes from the devil himself. With all power. He'll perform miracles, signs. He'll perform miracles and lying wonders. In verse 10, it says, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be contemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And so this Antichrist, this man of sin, this man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, we read in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, will be empowered or energized by the devil himself. He'll have the working of Satan, it says there, signs, lying wonders, and incredible deception. What else do we know about this Antichrist? We'll turn over to Daniel chapter 7. We looked at this verse last time. Remember that beast, The Antichrist is known by many names. The most common is actually the beast. And we read about this animal that represents all of world governments, the collection of nations that gathers together at the end times against Israel, against God. And it says out of this beast, there were 10 kings represented by 10 horns. And then we read a little horn came, a little horn grew up. Notice in verse eight of Daniel seven, I was considering the horns. These ten kingdoms or ten kings. And there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And so apparently, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he will rise in power among this global empire of ten confederacies or nations, and three of them he'll either consolidate or completely destroy. I don't know exactly how. But he will be, as it says, a little horn. Isn't it funny how so many dictators down through the years are small people? Putin is a small man, isn't he? Hitler, this is not part of my notes. I'm just thinking about how these small people have risen to great infamy. Ahmadinejad, he's a small man. He's like three feet tall. You could actually squish him with your... A friend of mine called me a couple years ago, and he was just looking at some of the stuff Schwarzenegger was doing in California with these, these bills, and he said, could Schwarzenegger be the Antichrist? I said, I don't know. I don't know. You could probably work it out with the names. I don't know. It's hard to say who it is. Actually, the Antichrist is named Joe. He lives in Denmark, and I have his email here for you this morning. We don't know who the Antichrist is. But it says here he's like a little horn. And notice it says three horns were pulled up by their roots. Or in other words, he takes over three kingdoms. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man. That is, he he knows. He has insight. He's not just a dumb power. He has insight and he has a mouth speaking pompous words. Here's one thing that you'll notice about this person is he is a blasphemer. Notice over in verse 24. The ten horns are ten kings who will arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after them. That's the Antichrist. He will be different from the first ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak pompous words against the Most High and shall persecute the saints of the Most High. And he shall intend to change times and law. So this man probably will hope to change the calendar and law. Why would he want to change the calendar? Well, because our calendar is based on the birth of Jesus Christ. Maybe he'll have a new calendar. Let's start over, people. Friends of the world, let's begin a new era, a new age, and start from one right now, beginning all over again. I don't know. But he he shall intend to change times and laws. It doesn't say that he does so. And the Bible says the saints will be given into his hand for a time, one, times, two more, and a half a time. Three and a half years. Time, times, and a half a time. A little over in Daniel chapter 11, we read another thing about this man. 
A little more description as the caricature begins to take shape. Daniel 11, verse 36. Then the king shall do according to his own will. He's a self-willed or a willful king. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god and speak blasphemies against the god of gods. And he shall prosper until the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been determined shall be done. So the Antichrist will magnify himself above all others. And he'll survive through till the end of the tribulation, till the wrath has been accomplished. Notice verse 37. He will regard neither neither the God, and that word could be translated gods or God. The word is Elohim in plural, which is a plural word. The Lord is one, but it says Elohim, and that's a plural word. So we don't know if it speaks of his heritage as a Jew or as a Gentile. He will regard neither the God of his father or gods of his fathers, nor the desire of women. Some people have said that the Antichrist must be a homosexual because of this passage. Most likely, it says because he doesn't regard the desire of women, he regards neither God nor the Messiah. See, the desire of women was to bear the Messiah. And so probably this character will just say, I dismiss everything. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Jesus. And it also says there, he will not regard any God. I don't believe in God at all. Why? For he shall exalt himself above them all. There's no God big enough for this guy. He's the only one that can fill those shoes. Notice in verse 38, in their place, in the place of God or Jesus or any other deity, he shall honor a God of fortresses. And that word can be translated forces. His power will be his God. Forces, a God which his fathers didn't know. He shall honor with gold and silver. In other words, he'll spend all of his money all of this government's money on articles of war with precious stones and pleasant things. He shall act against the strongest fortresses or strongest forces with a foreign God and he shall acknowledge and advance to its glory. He shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. So this guy is going to be a big talker. He's going to have big plans and he's going to have a big ego. Finally, we look at Revelation chapter 13. Last week we discussed this global empire and some of the things that have happened in the past hundred years, the converging of nations, the revitalization of the former Roman states, and now we're seeing sort of a coalescing of all these powers. We mentioned that that's the beast. Remember when Nebuchadnezzar was told, you are the head of gold. He was the personification of Babylon. When you think of Hitler, you think of the same thing as Nazi Germany. And so the beast that we read about here is not only the empire, but it's the very person. And so John says, I stood on the stand of the sea and I saw a beast rising out of the sea. Those Gentile nations in the Mediterranean. He had seven heads and ten horns and on his horns ten crowns and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him authority. The dragon is Satan. He gave him his authority, his throne, and great power. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed after the beast. And so it looks like there will be an assassination attempt on the Antichrist. He is either shot or uh, there's an attempted murder on him. We don't know exactly how it will happen. But Zechariah tells us, and I'll read it for you, Zechariah chapter 11, verse 17, God speaking about what he calls the worthless shepherd. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword will be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. Scholars for years have believed that this speaks of the Antichrist. He will be assassinated, but will miraculously come back to life or some miracle will happen where he survives. And at this point, the world will follow after him. It's possible that he does die and his body is filled and possessed by the devil himself. Because when he comes back, the whole world begins to worship him. Verse four of Revelation 13 says, and so they worship the dragon. Satan worship, is it possible? Yes, it is. Who gave authority to the beast or this person and who worshiped the beast. The world worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? 
The Bible says he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Another title we can call the Antichrist. Man of sin, son of perdition. We can call him Big Mouth. He's just got a big, fat, blasphemous mouth. All he does is talk trash against God. And so it says he was given authority, though, for 42 months, three and a half years, probably the first three and a half years over uh, the nation of Israel. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted with him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And those who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, the Antichrist is not alone. Every politician needs an interest group. And this man has another animal altogether. We read in verse 11, I saw another beast. Not to confuse you at all, but there's a whole other animal in this story. I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. In symbolism in the Bible, the sea speaks of the Gentile nations. But the land always speaks of Israel, the land of Israel. And so there will be a false prophet that will arise out of the nation Israel. And it says there that he has two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. Have you ever met a person like that? They look so nice on the outside, so religious. But when they open their mouth and they speak, it's just sulfur from hell. Well, this is what this person is like. He looks incredibly wonderful. But when he begins to speak, it sounds like the belching of hell itself. Just satanic words of deception and falsehood and lies. And so he had horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And notice this, and he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So the whole world will listen to this false teacher, especially Israel, and they will cut a covenant, a contract with this world leader, the Antichrist, for seven years. And the whole world will worship him because he survived this deadly wound. Verse 13, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and he lived. I have an interesting article here. May 18th, 2007. Messiah mystery follows death of mystical rabbi. It's from World Net Daily. I'll read part of it to you. A controversy raising in it, a controversy is raging in Israel in evangelical circles in the U.S. and on Kabbalah web forums worldwide following the release of what a revered rabbi claimed to be the name of the Messiah. When Rabbi Yitzhak Kaduri died in February 2006, Close to 110 years old, 300,000 people attended his funeral in Jerusalem. The Baghdad-born Kabbalist had gained notoriety around the world for issuing apocalyptic warnings and for saying he personally met the long-awaited Jewish Messiah in November 2003. Before Kaduri died, he reportedly wrote the name of the Messiah on a small note requesting it remained sealed for one year after his death. That note was recently opened and read. The name that it revealed? Yeshua. About his encounter with the Messiah, Kaduri claimed he is alive today in Israel. He reportedly told his close relatives, quote, he's not saying I'm the Messiah, give me leadership. Rather, the nation is pushing him to lead. After they find signs showing that he has the status of Messiah, Kaduri was also quoted as saying the imminent arrival of the Messiah will, quote, save Jerusalem from Islam and Christianity that wish to take Jerusalem from the Jewish nations. But they will not succeed. They will fight with each other. Now, statements like that have some Christians wondering if Kaduri might be talking about another Yeshua, perhaps even a miracle working false Christs. Many evangelicals believe will precede the return of Jesus. The article goes on. Uh, the big point is that Yeshua is Jesus' name. And so people were saying, is this man a Christian? 
Because on his notes, there are even little crosses written. People are puzzled. What is this guy about? Of course, Kabbalah is a cult. It's Jewish mysticism. Madonna even wanted to meet with this guy because she's into that. And he said, no way. So when they looked at his notes, they were puzzled because there are crosses. You know, Jews won't even use crosses when they, they do math. They don't even use plus signs. You heard about the Jewish kid. There's the joke. The Jewish kid is sent to, to a Catholic school because he's so disobedient. And when he comes back, his grades have totally changed. And math especially. And his parents said, how did you do so good in math, son? And he said, those people worship the plus sign. You won't believe it in there. But the thing about this rabbi is he actually had crosses written. So when they discovered that this guy said the name of Messiah is Yeshua, he had been dead a year. And they said, well, how can this be? Was this guy a Christian? The Messiah's name is Yeshua? Well, that's not what he was saying, but what it's looking like is that he's pointing to the rise of a religious leader that will actually be anti-Jesus or the anti-Yeshua. A few months before his death, Kaduri said Messiah would not come until former Prime Minister Ariel Sharon dies. Sharon was Prime Minister from 2001 to 2006. He suffered a stroke. He fell into a coma. And he's still in a coma today. Shortly after Kaduri supposedly met the Messiah and learned his name, the rabbi began warning of impending disasters worldwide. In September 2005, in a class in Jerusalem, Kaduri called for Jews all over the world to return to Israel because of the calamities about to befall the earth and for the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. In the future, he says, the Holy One, blessed be he, will bring about great disasters in the countries of the world to sweeten the judgments of the land of Israel, he said. In 1990, the late Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, this is a a man, when I was in Israel about 10 years ago, uh, you would go around and you see these huge signs, these banners, yellow banners with like a red sunset. And it had Hebrew writing, and I don't read Hebrew writing, but when you ask the tour guide, what is that writing? And they will say that's that's the Hebrew writing for the phrase, get ready, Messiah is coming. Get ready, Messiah is coming. It was all over Israel. They were saying, get ready, the Messiah is coming. And they believed that it was this man, Menachem Schneerson. He was called the rabbi by everybody. The problem is he died. He died and his followers still said, this man's going to come back to life and he is going to be the Messiah. Now, this other rabbi who was 110 years old who died last year met this man. And this man, who they called the Messiah, the rabbi who passed away, he told Kaduri that he would live to see the Messiah. And so, in 2003, Kaduri met a man who claimed to be the Messiah. Or, he doesn't know he's the Messiah, but he was told that he would be. And he'll be revealed after Sharon dies. And Sharon is on his deathbed as we speak. In September 2005, Kaduri said, The Messiah is already in Israel, and there will be peace throughout the world. And it goes on. It's not going to be the real Messiah. My point is this. People in Israel are craving and hoping for a leader that will die and maybe even come back from the dead. They're looking for the false prophet as we speak. Now, we read about this man back in Revelation in verse 16. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for as the number of a man, his number is 666. This is the most popular verse in the book of Revelation. 666. What does it mean? Whose name can we come up with? If you write the letters in Hebrew or in Greek, they have a numeric value and we can discover the name. Is this what John was talking about? Was John trying to identify somebody by a number that would be the Antichrist? I'm not so sure that he wanted to. In the Bible, the number seven speaks of completeness, perfection, seven days in a week, seven notes on a scale, seven colors in a rainbow, maybe more, but we can't see them. Seven is the number of perfection. Six is the number of imperfection. Thus, the number seven speaks of many times of the Lord himself. Seven times, Jesus said in the book of John in different ways, I am, I am the bread of life, I am the door, I am the light of the world. 
Seven speaks of the number of God. Man is the number six, always incomplete, always falling short, just short. And so I believe that the number 666 probably doesn't speak so much about a person as the epitome of man's perfection. You might say it's perfect imperfection in triplicate. 666. What will it be? Well, some people believe that it could be a mark. It could be a chip. We know that there is the technology now to uh, actually mark people and tag them. This is an article from Kuala Lumpur. Malaysia to export world's smallest microchip by world's end. Malaysia said Tuesday will begin commercial production of the world's smallest microchip by the end of the year. Interest already coming from countries like China and the United States. The government last September bought the rights to Japan's FEC Incorporated to the revolutionary chip so small it can be embedded in everything from money to human bodies to prevent banknote and document forgery or for keeping track of goods and people. Canada and Australia have expressed interest in exploring the use of the chip in their national identity cards and in Mexico for its election card. While China, Taiwan, and the United States are also keen on the product. And so there is a chip that can be implanted. The Bible speaks about a time when to participate in the global economy, you need to be marked. You need to have an identity. This could never have happened. It wasn't even feasible when John wrote it. But now, it's not only feasible, not only is it possible, it's actually pragmatic. Could you imagine having a microchip placed in your hand or, or anywhere on your body where you could walk into a, sh- a store and take anything off the shelf and just leave? No lines. Boy, I get it just for that, a lot of people would say. Because radio frequency identification, RFID, is an automatic identification system. If you haven't heard about this now, you probably will soon. RFID tags are tiny chips which respond to sensors, they're transponders, basically they, they're just sitting there inert saying, who am I, who am I, who am I? When they come in contact with the transmitter, that starts them, so they say, here I am. And so what happens is, is you can tag millions of items, cattle, dogs, animals, sheep, and they can be tracked through this radio frequency ID. They transport uh, payments, uh, they're used in cards, passes, toll booths, ski lift, subways, public transportation, they're used in Product tracking, inventory, libraries, Walmart uses them in just about everything. Um, Automotive, smart keys, many of your keys actually have RFID chips in them, so they won't work uh, if it's just the key. It has to have that little black part in the end. That's because the microchips are connected between the ignition and the key. The Department of Defense requires all pallets to be smart labeled with these things. Animals are tagged with RFID chips. Livestock and pets are uh, embedded and tracked. Human implants are actually becoming more common for safety. In 2004, the Mexican Attorney General's office implanted 18 of its staff members with the Verichip to control access to a secure data room. Actually, in Barcelona, Spain, and in the Netherlands, you can actually get a microchip so you can get in and out of nightclubs. It's becoming very common. It's being experimented with on uh, prisoners, on military personnel. Certain pilots now have to carry certain cards so that they're uh, identified where they're at at all times. Could you imagine bypassing all the security at the airport? Well, you can if you just get this microchip implanted in your body. Now, it's beginning to happen. It's happening already. Hospital patients are being chipped right now. Prisoners, military, they're being experimented with. People are ready for this stuff. The Department of Defense began developing what they call multi-technology automated reading cards or mark cards. Many of you in the military, how many of you have a mark card? You have mark cards. They're multi-technology reading cards. They're, they're cards with a chip to identify you. The problem is that your card can get lost. How many of you ever had your credit card canceled when you're standing in line? Because they've canceled it because they thought maybe you lost it and somebody used it so they closed it down. I was trying to get gas the other day. It happened to me twice in the past three months. It's driving me nuts. I call them. They say, what's your, your wife's mother's maiden name? What's your wife's social security number? Ask me something I know. And it's so frustrating. I wish I could just have something on my body all the time. That's what people will say. And so it's possible even now. I want to close to you with this. I don't know who the Antichrist is going to be. I don't know his name. But as we began, I'll end. The world is looking for a leader. It's looking for somebody to take over and to run things smoothly. There is a man that many people are looking at with curiosity. I'm not into salaciousness. 
saying things to get people all excited that will fade away in a couple of years. We don't like to set dates, but you do need to be aware. And there is somebody that's rising the ranks rapidly in Europe right now. His name's Javier Solana. Let me read you an article from May 31st, 2007. March 31st, rather, 2007. Solana says, stage being set for comprehensive peace. Developments in the Middle East are pointing toward a comprehensive peace agreement between Israel and the Arab world for the first time in decades. The European Union's foreign policy chief said Saturday, Javier Solana said, the Arab League for the first time in many years has assumed the responsibility to be more active in the peace process. If you put together with the reaction of Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, the two things are beginning to construct the dynamic that could lead to the settlement of a crisis which has been with us for many years. Solana, who attended last week's Arab League in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, praised the host for assuming a leadership role in reviving a 2002 Arab peace initiative. The moment in which we are living is a moment of hope that we may be able to move the process of comprehensive peace forward, Solana told reporters at the beginning of EU, European Union foreign ministers. Who is this Solana guy anyway? And why are people interested in him? Well, from 1995 to 1999, he took over the NATO troops. He took over in NATO for those four years. After this, it's interesting because in 1998, the European Union created a new position. The new position they created was called the High Representative of CFSP, the Common Foreign Security Policy. This position actually has vast emergency powers. Now, a lot of leaders in the world are being given vast emergency powers. George Bush is one of them. Putin is another one of them. This man is another one. He is given vast emergency powers under an interesting document written in 1998 by the European Union. The European Union's General Report 1998 in Chapter 5, entitled Role of the Union in the World, gave Javier Solana this vast sweeping power as the High Representative of Common Foreign Security Policy by recommendation number 666. After receiving this position, because of recommendation 666, Solana's power was increased when he was given a mandate to create an army, ostensibly for security purposes. Right now it's 60,000 strong and it's called the European Rapid Reaction Force. Solana's authority grew again in 2004 when he was made president of the European Defense Agency. In 1999, prior to this, Javier Solana became the Secretary General of the European Union and the Western European Union. And so begin counting the number of positions this man has. He is the High Representative of CFSP. He is the Secretary General of the European Union and the Secretary General of the Western European Union. He is in charge of the European Rapid Reaction Force. He is president of the European Defense Agency, which provides oversight in mil military spending in Europe. And in 2004, he was scheduled to become the first Minister of Foreign Affairs. That's a position, a new position that combined the Commission of Foreign Relations and the Vice Presidency of the EU. It would have gone through if the European Constitution had been ratified. But remember, in 2005, France rejected it. France did not ratify the European Constitution, but there is renewed hope that France will now ratify their Constitution under its newly elected leadership. There doesn't seem to be a position that this man doesn't hold. In the year 2000, the Clinton administration said that Solana was the fulfillment of Henry Kissinger's desire to have a phone number that they could call to talk to Europe. This man is Mr. Europe. He's a superhero. And he's also a member of the local chapter of the Club of Rome, which we spoke about last week. This is from Wikipedia about Javier Solana. U.S. Ambassador to NATO, Alexander Vershbau, said of him, he is an extraordinary consensus builder who works behind the scenes with leaders on both sides of the Atlantic. He's a frequent speaker of the prestigious U.S.-based Council on Foreign Relations. He's a member of the Spanish section of the Club of Rome. He has received the Grand Cross of Isabel the Catholic in Spain and the Manfred Werner Medal that honors public figures who have rendered, quote, special meritorious service to peace and freedom in Europe. 
He was awarded this from the German Defense Ministry. He is also the president of the Mariaga European Foundation since 1998. He received the Vision for Europe Award in 2003. In 2003, he received the Statesman of the Year Award from the East-West Institute, a transatlantic think tank that organizes an annual security conference in Brussels. In 2006, Solana received a Carnegie Wadler Peace Prize. He's also been awarded the Charlemagne Prize in 2007 for his distinguished service on behalf of European unification. Charlemagne was the one who founded the Holy Roman Empire around the year 800 A.D. It lasted to about 1800 in Germany. He was a Frank, and so this man is everywhere. Something to think about. I will close with a quote that I gave in the beginning. Paul Henry Spock, Prime Minister of Belgium and the first President of the United Nations, he said, we don't want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man. Whether he be God or the devil, we will receive him. What does this mean for us? When will he come? Who was this man going to be? Is it going to be him? I don't know. But in Luke chapter 21, Jesus says in the end, times are going to get worse. Things are going to happen. We're beginning to see them happening now. I'm going to read to you from Luke chapter 21. Jesus said, these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And people will fall by the edge of the sword. They'll be led away captive into all nations. Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. And men's heart will be failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. These things are beginning to happen now. A new coalition of nations, the rise of false Christs, technology for the mark of the beast, the rise of new diseases, pestilence, earthquakes, famines around the world. But the next verse says, now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. And so the Lord is coming back and we are ready because the Bible says that we will be removed before this happens. There was a story about a man who went to Italy He was a tourist and he found an exquisite garden. And the caretaker of the garden was asked by this tourist, how long have you been here? And the caretaker said, 25 years. And the tourist asked, well, how often has the owner come to see this garden that you oversee? And the man said, four times. And he said, well, when is the last time he came? He said, 12 years ago. And the man was amazed because the garden looked so wonderfully clean and well taken care of. And and the, the tourist said, well, who takes care of the garden? And he says, just me, I'm pretty much left alone. And then the tourist said, well, you keep the garden so spick and span that one would think that you're expecting the owner to come home tomorrow. And the man simply responded, today, sir, today, replied the caretaker, perhaps today. The Lord could come back today before we get in our cars. He could come back before I finish this sentence. (laughs) Let's stand and pray. Father, we thank you that you are coming back, that all these things that we read about are in your hands, that you have all authority and power, and that, Jesus, you will not leave us or forsake us, but you'll come again for us. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us the knowledge and the wisdom of the Scriptures. We pray that we would be able to bear this in our heart and be wise as we live our lives in these last days. We ask you to bless us as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.